you for joining us today in another episode of Recovered Truth. My name is Greg Reeser, the pastor here at uh, Crosswork Bible Church. And as you can see, our background is a little bit different than it normally is. Uh, we're not able to meet right now at the Holiday Inn Express due to uh, the, the lockdowns and all that fun stuff. So uh, we're bringing this to, uh, to you from our home. And I do want to thank you all for joining us in our home for this Bible study. And as we've said before, we're, gonna, we're just going to mention it again. Uh, what we do here is we're going to study the Bible. Uh, and what happens is when we study the Bible, what that's going to do is it's going to produce a life in you uh, that you cannot produce on your own. A lot of folks go around, they say they do things, they do this, they do that. And that's their proof that... Uh, that they're saved. The only proof that you need to look to is the cross. Right? When you look at the cross, that's the only thing that makes you saved. You doing things isn't proof of it. The, the, the death, burial, and resurrection is the proof of it. You placing and trusting your faith and your faith alone in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, what He did, His faithfulness to do what He did on the cross. Uh, what happens is God at that, at that time takes you and places you into living union with His Son. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to continue on a, a message that we started in, in the last program, dealing with baptism. Now, I know and understand that this is a sore subject for a lot of people. And again, I do want to mention, I actually grew up in the, the Baptist um, denomination. And what happened is, is I started questioning some things, and I started reading the Bible. I know that's a, that's a novel thing for a young man to do. Uh, but I started reading the Bible after I was um, brought to my attention. There's some issues, and there's some issues that I had. So what I did is I started studying the Bible. And what I did is I found out that the baptism that I was taught as a young man in a Baptist church isn't the issue. And there's something different that's going on today. And we've talked about that before as you take a look at Scripture. God tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And what we found out the last time, there is a truth about the fact that John the Baptist water, water baptized, that Jesus Christ was going to baptize with the Holy Ghost, and that Jesus Christ was going to baptize with fire. Now again, we talked about that. John the Baptist was baptizing with water at the first part of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the early ministry stages of Jesus Christ's life. Then you've got Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. The Holy Ghost comes down upon the men in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And that's where Jesus Christ baptizes them with the Holy Ghost with the ability to do some things only to prove God's words true. And then there's going to be a baptism where Jesus Christ is going to baptize them with fire. And that's not a fire of the Holy Spirit baptism that a lot of people get misunderstood. That's that's a fire baptism that you don't want to be a part of. All right. So we talked about those three baptisms in one verse last time. And we started talking about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul's laying out in in verses 4, 5 and 6, he's laying out for us the seven ones of the unity of the spirit. And one of the things that we notice there in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, is there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Now, not to be misguided or anything like that, in the context, he's talking about the unity of the Spirit. All right? So he says there's one body in verse 4, one Spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling. So you've got one body and one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one hope, and what we started taking a look at last time is, if there's one baptism, which one of those three do we get to choose? And we said, you don't get to choose which one of those three. Um, denominational settings aren't allowed to choose for us what we're going to get. What it comes down to is, is, do we believe God's Word? That's the issue. And when we allow God's Word to be the issue and the final authority in things, then this stuff's not really that hard. And again, I know it's a, it's a highly um, emotional issue for a lot of people. And there will be some blowback on, on this topic, and I'm fine with that. I would rather be right 
based on what Scripture says than to be wrong based upon what a doctrinal statement of a denomination says. That's my conviction. And when I stand before the throne of Jesus Christ, when He, when he, when he judges me at the Bema Seat, the judgment seat of Christ, I know for a fact that His Word is going to be the thing that, that's led my entire life. I'm not worried about um, blowback or, or anything like that. I want, to, I want to be able to stand on the Word of God, rightly divided. So when we see this, we've got one body, one spirit, and one baptism. I'm going to pull those three out to make sure that we see this. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is where we left off the last time. And because there's some verses that I want to make sure that we get, we need to get on with the program. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. He says, For as the body is one in faith, and hath many members. So you've got the one body there. We talked about that. The one body. Um, and hath many members. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So you know, right there in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, we see that term, one body. By the way, the body of Christ, which is what we're going to find out here in just a second, so that body that he's talking about, is never talked about prior to Paul's epistles. Now if we keep on going, notice in verse 13, for by one spirit, that's that one spirit of Ephesians chapter 4 that we just got through reading, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile. Now we talked about this before. When Jesus Christ is talking to the twelve disciples, what's He tell them? Go not into the way of the Gentiles, enter ye not, or into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. Why? Or what's he, what are they supposed to do? But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Was there a distinction back here? Well, that's the whole purpose of that distinction. There is a difference between Jew and Gentile. Well, what's this verse right here says? Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, whether, uh, um, and have all been made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. There's not a difference there. He's taking that difference out. The Jew-Gentile, taking it out. Bond or free, taking it out. There's no difference. We go over to Galatians and we find out that there is no difference in the dispensation of the grace of God. That they're all one. That they're all sinners. That God might have mercy upon all. And so what we see here is there's, there's this body. This one body. By the way, when we looked at this before... Who baptized with water? John the Baptist. Now, of course, I know and understand you could go through and say, well, so did the twelve apostles. They did. You can go along and say, um, everybody else that had anything to do with that, they did. Jesus Christ did. I understand that. Then they'll come along and say, aha, but your Paul did too. All right? We'll take a look at that one. Now, what I want you to notice here is you've got who baptized with the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. Who baptized with fire? Jesus Christ. Who baptized into one body was the one Spirit. Who's doing the baptizing? The one Spirit. Here you've got Jesus Christ baptizing into the Holy Spirit. Here you've got the Holy Spirit baptizing us into living union with the, with the Son, Jesus Christ. It's backwards. It can't be the same. In math, if this is A... And that's C. If C uh, points to A, here you can't have A and C the same thing. They're backwards. They're two different things. If, if A points to C, and then over here you got A points to C, and then here you got C points to A, those aren't the same thing. Can't be. Never have been, never will be. It's the same ideas. Things spoken since the world began, and things kept secret since the world began. They cannot be the same thing. So as we take a look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see that this one body, drop down to verse 27, he says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So this one body is what? The body of Christ. Which is not mentioned prior to Paul's epistles. 
So this one baptism that we have, where the one Spirit baptizes us into the one body, which is the body of Christ, is wholly different than these three over here. And by the way, I would even go to say that that baptism was never spoken of or revealed until you get to go over to Romans chapter 6. Now, I know what people do with the book of Romans, specifically chapter 6. They make a mess out of it. And it's because what we do a lot of times is we spiritualize passages because we're not looking with spiritual eyes. And what we do is we end up speaking spiritual lies. And then people come along and say, man, that's good stuff, so I'm going to believe it. Well, what we see here in Romans chapter 6 is Romans chapter 6 has absolutely nothing to do with this. But Romans chapter 6 has everything to do with this over here. And I know what people do. I've seen it. We've talked about it before. How many, you know, how are you supposed to baptize? You're supposed to sprinkle or dunk, dunk forward, dunk backwards in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What, which one are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to do it? Well, I'm here to tell you that this baptism is something that takes place the moment that you believe and you don't have to do anything to do it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an operation that God performs the moment that you trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a baptism that no one can see. And I know what people do is they say, well, I need to be water baptized because I need to, to, to prove to everybody that I'm saved. And then they'll pull up the verse and says, uh, if, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. And they have no idea what they're doing with that verse. That has absolutely nothing to do with baptism. Maybe we'll take a look at that verse one day. That verse has absolutely nothing to do with it. Do you know what's going to happen? You go, over to, you go over to Timothy and you find out that Jesus Christ cannot deny Himself. And if you're in Christ, He couldn't deny you if you wanted Him to. If you wanted Him to fulfill that verse that He would deny you before the Father, He can't do it because of 1 Timothy. He can't deny Himself because if He takes and, you, and, he, he, and when you get saved and He places you into living union with Himself, He can't deny Himself. We are members in particular of that one body. We become a living... We, we, we go into living union with the, with the Son. And He can't deny Himself. So what do you do with that verse? Well, you put it in the proper context and understand what He's talking about there. Instead of trying to spiritualize it and put people under some sort of rule. And make them think that they have to get water baptized. Otherwise, you're not really saved. The problem is, is God says you are saved if you place your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son. And what God does is He comes along and He performs something for you. There's this little acronym, CRIBS. Just a few of the things that take place the moment you get saved. See, you're circumcised. Without hands. Not the circumcision that He's talking to Abraham back here about. You're regenerated. You're given life. You're quickened, as Ephesians 2 says. You're indwelt. You're indwelt by the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit the moment that you get saved. You're baptized, which means you're placed in a living union with Jesus Christ. And you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. And what He's going to do is He's going to take this body and give it, give it away and toss it away and give unto us a body fashioned like unto Christ's glorious body. And He sealed you until that day happens. Well, that's an amazing truth that we need to live by. But instead of allowing somebody to come along and spiritualize passages like they do with here in Romans chapter 6, notice Romans chapter 6, verse, verse 3. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, which is this right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, were baptized into His death. By the way, that baptism has absolutely nothing to do with water. It's the baptism that the, Holy, that the one Spirit baptizes us with that one baptism into the one body. 
I know what people do with this verse. They, they put people down in water and say, buried with Him in baptism and raised unto life. There is no water ceremony ever that can do that for you. Not even baptism, when it was supposed to have been done, could have done that for you. Because that was not a truth revealed until it was revealed to Paul. So when we see this here, this has absolutely nothing to do with water. Notice, know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. You know what you need to do there? You need to know that. He says, know ye not? A lot of people don't. Unfortunately, a lot of pastors don't. And that's a sad commentary on the local, on the, on the, the local churches. But notice, he says here, you need to know something. Know ye not? No, you don't. A lot of people don't. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. That's this baptism here. We're baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What happens is, you have Jesus Christ, He... In fact, let's do it up here. He was crucified, buried, and rose again. And what this baptism does is identifies you with His death. His death is now your death. Water can't do that. His burial is now your burial. Water can't do that. His resurrection is your resurrection and water cannot do that. In fact, <clears throat> go real quick. Go over to Colossians real quick. We see the same, we see the same idea. Colossians chapter 2. There's something else that takes place here that we need to know and understand as we go through these to be able to rely and rest on what God's Word says. Now, this baptism we have is we're baptized into Christ and we're completely in a, and, and fully identified with His death and burial and resurrection. You need to get that, folks. There's no water ceremony that can do that. God's done that already. So, what we need to do is find out what God's already done for us and go live based off of that instead of trying to gain something that God's already given us. You know, I use this analogy all the time. If I put $100 in your bank account and then you came up and said, man, I wish I had $100, I'd say, well, it's in, your, it's in the bank account. Just go use it. Like, well, you know, that's not what Pastor so-and-so said. They said my bank account zero, so I'm going to go by what they say rather than go and look at the bank statement that's printed off that I can read in English. By the way, what people do is they'll come along and they'll say that this baptism, well, that's, that's, that's baptismos or baptism. None of you all know Greek. Don't act like you do. Now I can I've got a Greek I've got a Greek dictionary back here. I've got a book that says learn how to how to how to read Greek. You know what I've got? I've got a book in English. God has revealed to me his word in English that I can read it, study it, understand it and apply it. I don't need Greek. You don't need Hebrew. You don't need the original manuscripts. You know, a lot of people say, well, we need the original manuscripts and this version's more closely... Than... Go back to Jeremiah and you read the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah reads... Uh, he has... Jehudi reads it. And what the king does is he cuts it up with a pen knife and throws it in the, in the, in the fire and it burns up. And God creates a second copy. The copy is the issue. God has revealed His Word and He's preserved it throughout the ages through multiplicity of copies so that you and I can have it with our hands and read it in our language. And that book is the King James Bible. You don't need the original manuscripts. Don't care. Don't worry about Greek and Hebrew. All that person does when they pull up Greek and Hebrew is to make themselves look smarter to you. And I've done it. I've fallen for it. Hook, line, and sinker. We don't care about that stuff. What does the book say in English? And it tells us right here, notice in Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. He's talking about, In Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, in verse 9, verse 10. And ye are complete in Him. By the way, when I stop there for just a second and say this, the moment that you're placed into living union with Jesus Christ, you are complete. There's nothing you need to add. There's nothing that God can add. If you are complete, what's that mean? You're complete. 
Now the problem is a lot of times we see that verse and it's hard to believe it. But do you know what faith is? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. What you do is you believe that that verse is true. I believe that I am complete in Christ and there is absolutely nothing I can do, say, feel, or anything to add to or take away of who I am because it's not me, it's Christ. He says, And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Notice, in whom also ye are, ye are circumcised, past tense, with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off and putting off of the body of the sins in the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Do you know what this baptism has to do with? We're going to find out. It has to do with this circumcision. It's something, folks, it takes place the moment that you trust in the death, burial, and resurrection. Both of these things take place. You don't have to wait for it. It's something that takes place the moment. Notice. Buried with Him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God. Do you know what? It's the operation of God that does this. Not your pastor. Not John the Baptist. This is something that God the Father does the moment that we get saved. By the way, when you think about this... The triune Godhead, which we just got through reading, that, that in Him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead is involved in your salvation. You ever think about that? What happens is, <clears throat> the faith of the operation of God. The operation of God is what? He takes... And He says, if you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son, there's the Son, and, and the moment you do that, the Spirit takes and places you by the operation of God the Father, places you into living union with one, with one body. That's the body of Christ. That's the triune Godhead involved in your salvation. It's not a ceremony. There's a reason why that ceremony existed for the nation of Israel. They were to be a kingdom of priests. Do you know what one of the things you had to do in order to be a priest? You had to be water baptized. By the way, sprinkling, not dunking. Go search the scriptures and find out. Don't look at the denominations, doctrinal statements. Go read the verses. It's sprinkling. It was a sprinkling. It was a washing that takes place. What God does today is He takes and places us into living union with the Son and the Holy Spirit produces that life in it and the, and the triune Godhead is involved in every bit of it. Notice in verse 12, Buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Do you know what He does? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what they do is they're operative in your salvation and what happens is the operation of God takes over circumcises you the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the one body that's Christ and all three of them are there now a lot of people come along and say hey didn't Paul baptize <clears throat> well, I'm glad you brought that up go over to 1st Corinthians chapter 1 and let's take a look at this in the last couple of minutes of the time that we have here 1st Corinthians chapter 1 Notice in verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. And of course, Cephas there is Peter. Verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Notice, verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Do you know what he says? I'm glad I didn't baptize as many as I could have because he knows something about what he's going to write in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
because he's saying he's basically saying the water baptism that I participated in here is done away with with the one that I want to tell you about in chapter 12. And here's another thing. <clears throat> Hold your place there and go get John chapter 1. Look at John chapter 1. Hold your place here in John chapter 1. And I want you to notice a difference here. Again, differences are okay. What most people consider contradictions in the Scripture, it's okay when you know how to deal with them. Notice in John chapter 1 verse 33. John chapter 1 verse 33. And I knew him not. This, of course, John is talking here. Uh, <clears throat> John chapter 1, verse 33, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same is said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is, is, is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So here's the question. Was John the Baptist sent to baptize? Absolutely. Go back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Do you know what Paul says? I wasn't sent the way that John the Baptist was. I wasn't sent, but I was sent to preach the gospel. Do you know what the gospel does? It tells you that, G that the Holy Spirit will, will, will baptize you into this one body, into Christ. There's a stark difference there, folks. Now, I know what people do is they'll say, well, Paul was just sent to evangelize. There is no verse in Scripture that tells Paul that he's just supposed to go and evangelize. He's an evangelist. He is an apostle. We'll take a look at that next time. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, grace and peace.